coming back. Um, uh, I guess I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jesse Sana, and I'm talking about uh, aerial thermography today. Um, co-author with Elise Legere, who's here, and also the co-organizer of this session, and um, our third author, Austin Chad, as his friends Noam Hill, who's a postdoctoral fellow working with us back at Dartmouth. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just want to, so um, thermal imagery is, I think, a, a very exciting but still underutilized resource in archaeological prospection in general. It's, um, you know, has the potential to reveal all kinds of archaeological features over very large areas very quickly in, in a manner similar to archaeological geophysics, except um, with the ability to collect these data um, many orders of magnitude larger in scale. This is not like news, right? This is something that archaeologists have known theoretically to be true going back to the 1970s. Um, in this uh, image from Gary Wilson's classic book, Air Photo Interpretation for Archaeologists, he shows, um, in this case, just a standard black and white aerial photograph taken of a series of um, Iron Age field walls and enclosures where, um, after a dusting of light snow, the melting over those walls has made them visible. The reason that they're visible in this case is because the walls and semi-subterranean features are emitting more thermal infrared radiation than the surrounding soil. And because of that, it has preferentially melted the snow. Um, but you know, in principle, we shouldn't need to wait for the snow to melt in order to see that, right? If they're emitting more thermal infrared radiation, that is something that we ought to be able to see in a thermal image if we capture it at an optimal time in the diurnal cycle. Um, uh, in theory, uh, there's a wide range of different kinds of archaeological features that ought to be visible in thermal imagery similarly. Right? Um, you could think of something like concentrations of artifacts. I apologize for my silly drawing, but um, uh, they, they look a little bit like poop with smell, but that's supposed to be artifacts <laughs> with, with, with thermal radiation coming off of them. So uh, they, they would affect the thermal properties of the ground if they're uh, storing or reflecting infrared radiation differently than the soil. Uh, anything like pits or ditches or earthworks that have different density and thus retain uh, moisture differently than the native soils will similarly have different thermal properties. Um, subterranean architecture or other features that are underground, if they heat and cool at a different rate or to a different degree in the surrounding soil, might be visible to a certain depth. We don't know exactly to what depth. Um, and of course, anything that is creating a subtle topographic feature on the ground. So uh, architecture, earthworks, you name it. Um, that raised platform will heat and cool differentially. This is true with raking light, but also just true because it's raised over the ground. So all these kinds of things ought to be visible, right? Um, and uh, all we need to do is be sure to capture an image at the best time during the day or night uh, as things heat and cool. So there's a, a point always within a, a diurnal cycle illustrated here where um, this thing works. Yeah, where everything is the same temperature. So if you were to take a picture, then you wouldn't see anything because they're all the same temperature. So this illustrates, for example, very dry soil versus water or very wet soil. So big thing we often see is differences in moisture content. Um, you would think that this would be the best time during the day. That's actually a terrible time because during daylight, um, most of the signal that you're going to see in a thermal image is reflective light from the sun. So you see most of the surface. If we're interested in what's under the surface, it's really necessary to capture these images at night. And so probably uh, later in the night, as these things cool and the differences become greater, would be an ideal moment. I didn't come up with that idea. That's something that was around for a while. It was just hard to actually ap operationalize these um, principles until relatively recently. I was initially inspired to go down this path by my former colleague, Ken Kabames, I think amazing work in which he uh, convinced some of his grad students, Eileen, and also I just learned yesterday one of himself in Tommy Haley's Powered Parachute. This was a survey that they did at the site of Double Ditch in South Dakota, um, where uh, using a handheld, like video camera sized, uncooled uh, a thermal camera, uh, they simply went up in a powered parachute and leaned over the side and took an analog video. 
and then laboriously stitched those hundreds of photos together. But the resultant data really rivaled um, other kinds of more conventional ground-based geophysics, including magnetometry and GPR and resistivity in terms of its ability to reveal archaeological features. In this case, a whole series of semi-subterranean earth lodges that constitute that site, as well as the two um, fortification ditches that surround it. So uh, that was exciting, but I thought, you know, obviously today the technology has been improved a lot, and it's really these kind of technological improvements that offer the ability to do what is that we're doing now. Um, the thermal cameras themselves have improved in leaps and bounds from the 1970s when um, liquid nitrogen cooled scanning radiometers like the Aries were all that was available. These would uh, image onto actual film and the, you had to pour liquid nitrogen periodically into them during the flight. It was a you know, specialized aircraft. Anyway, so, uh, the, moving forward into the 1990s with the uh, camera technology like that was being used by Ken Kamame. Um, up until the last few years, as very small action camera sized uncooled thermal cameras like the FLIR Tau 2 that we used in our previous work have become available and increasingly easy to mount onto unpiloted vehicles like drones. Uh, the, of course, dronery has changed a lot and moved very rapidly from a sort of fringe hobbyist pursuit just a few years ago to a central part of the archaeological toolkit and nearly ubiquitously deployed by archaeologists all over the world. Um, uh, so, you know, just a few years ago you would have needed that um, very scary aircraft uh, when we started doing this thing. Uh, even just back in 2012, 2013, we used this Sinistar 8, this thing that crashed constantly, it cost a ton of money. Uh, and of course, you know, in the last few years, it takes my, you know, my nine-year-old kid can fly the Phantom, and it's fun. So, um, and then, of course, the third element in this is the software, the photogrammetry that we've already heard a lot about, that enables you to very seamlessly take the images off of these cameras and produce ortho images that are uh, orthorectified, and uh, georeferenced with a uh, high degree of accuracy and a relatively limited amount of ease. So uh, the first time that we really successfully pulled these technologies together to produce some good data was at a survey I did in northern New Mexico at a site called the Blue Jay. It is a um, site contemporary with the better known Chaco Canyon just to north, um, and uh, situated in this sort of semi-arid region at the base of these uh, red sandstone cliffs. Uh, the site is comprised of several dozen of these sort of uh, subterranean house compounds visible at the surface. It's sort of remain rubble and artifact remains spread across this sort of scrubby landscape. Um, in color aerial imagery, uh, visible light of that site, uh, you can't see much. There's a road, there's some bushes, but none of the archaeology is very evident. Um, in a thermal image uh, taken, in this case, at about 7.15 in the morning, just after the sunrise, the topography of the landscape shows up very, very clearly, but again, we don't see anything subsurface, and that's a good illustration of why you don't want to do this during the day. Um, but uh, just two hours earlier, um, a whole range of archaeological features become evident. In this case, several of those uh, subterranean house compounds are visible here and here. Um, and uh, in this so in this instance, uh, the, the visibility of those features was maximized at a point uh, relatively late in the night. So we waited until uh, they had had the maximum amount of time to cool over the course of the night, but before the sun started heating them up in the morning. Um, and uh, this particular house compound then, uh, compared to say the excavation plan of the same thing, you can basically see all of the rooms, the perimeter wall, the interior features. So it's like as good as you could expect from pretty much any kind of geophysics, except that something you could capture really in just a few minutes. We can use this technology to survey, you know, a square kilometer in a day versus, you know, uh, a hectare or less. Um, at the same time though, the data from Blute also illustrates the degree to which thermal imagery in archaeology is uh, susceptible to serendipity effects. I mean, uh, uh, an image taken an hour in either direction of the really high quality imagery that we got uh, might be much less valuable in terms of what it can reveal. So imagery from say 10 p.m. on that same day makes it hard to see anything just because the ground was still too hot 
um, we're, and imagery from just an hour later is similarly kind of like meh because the ground is starting to heat up from the rising sun. Um, anyway, so that was something we published a few years ago. Over the last uh, year and a half or so, we have started to uh, continue our work using thermal imagery, except now uh, with a better series of uh, new sensors um, and um, improved drones and improved software. Uh, so notably, um, this past year, the company FLIR that produced the camera we used to use came out with a new drone optimized camera they call the FLIR View. Um, and then uh, also released a radiometric version of that camera, uh, which is the FLIR View Pro R, they call it. Unlike the older cameras that we used to use, which would um, provide a 8-bit uh, video feed um, that was also subject to an automatic gain control function, so it, the camera would just look around the room and then, or over the ground as you're flying, and then it will automatically ramp the image to make all the features in a given scene visible, which is good if you're using it to look for bears in the woods or fires inside of a wall, but is terrible if you're trying to um, mosaic these images together uh, or do anything kind of quantitative with the raster subsequent to that, because it's constantly shifting the values around. Unlike that, the FLIRView Pro R is supposed to provide radiometric imagery, so it instead outputs a, a still 14-bit image providing more than 16,000 values. So we can, in theory, differentiate much more subtle differences between hot and cool things on the ground. And we can also use it to perform a variety of different sort of raster-based analyses that I'll show in a minute. Um, we've mounted this on the now discontinued 3DR Solo, uh, which I like because it's cheap. You can buy these things for 350 bucks now, so they're basically disposable. They don't get the flight time that a Phantom does, but the advantage is that they're much easier to swap sensors out of. So you can buy custom gimbals like we did for this thing and put on the, um, the FLIR or other sensors pretty easily. Also, um, affixing the sensors to drones this way enables the imagery to be geotagged, so it's using the, the GPS on board with the drone to provide um, a geotag on each of the images, which facilitates their processing and photo scan or other kinds of photogrammetric software. And um, it also enables the imagery to be live view, so you can you know, have real-time telemetry on the imagery as it's being collected. Um, we've paired this also with uh, the Parrot Sequoia, another small sensor that captures uh, a four-band multispectral image, so in this case, a, a red, green, a uh, red edge and near infrared um, set of images along with a, a simple RGB image and um, a sunlight intensity reading. Um, this thing mounts similarly easily onto the Solo or other drones and uh, can be used to produce a range of different data sets including like an MDVI to look at vegetation differences. It can be used in combination with thermal imagery to filter stuff out. Um, and Elise is going to talk a little bit more about that after the break. And, I think Jason is as well, so I won't say too much more about it, but um, it's a powerful set of technologies. So I just want to take my remaining time now and uh, show some examples of some of the recent work we've been doing over the past few months. Um, we have a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that allows us to kind of travel around to different sites and try it out, see how it works. I like it because it's very low investment. It just takes a couple of days to do these surveys. And so basically, uh, I just uh, teamed up with a few of my friends who run archaeological projects in places I thought would be interesting to visit. And um, uh, yeah. so, uh, one example coming up um, uh, Lisa Overholzer up at McGill University runs an archaeological project at a site called Tlaxcala in the highlands of central Mexico. They'd never been to Mexico, so it seemed like a good opportunity. Um, the site itself is not one that you would think is very well suited for most kinds of geophysics or aerial imaging because it's covered with dense vegetation. Uh, this is a picture of the site. Lots of it is very steep, built on terraces, trees, large cactuses, and so forth. This is a challenging environment for any kind of geophysics or aerial imaging, but um, the point of our project is to try it out at different kinds of sites, so this was one such place. Um, Lisa's 
permit for the, the site itself is a very large urban center that was the capital of a um, sort of late prehistoric and early historic uh, confederacy that sort of fought against the Aztecs and sided with the Spanish. The site itself covers a huge area. Lisa's um, permit in the area where we surveyed is just one small component of the site, um, shown here in both uh, a visible like ortho mosaic and a digital surface model derived from those images. Uh, you can see that basically there's a lot of forest, but there's also these terraces that are visible in the image, and each one of those terraces has on it uh, usually a couple of houses or other buildings, and things like that. Um, so zooming into the uh, top of the site at the highest terrace, um, this is a false color near infrared uh, ortho image, and it shows pretty well that there's lots of large trees and plants, but not much of particular archaeological interest. Um, a thermal image of that same area that we captured, in this case at about 11.30 p.m., does, however, reveal um, at least a, one large sort of monumental building that's located in the center of that terrace um, that shows up as these uh, sort of higher value, that is warmer um, rectilinear things right there. Um, thinking that the best time to capture our thermal imagery would be later in the night, more like in the wee hours, three or four in the morning, we went back again at, um, in this case, about 4 a.m., except now the site sucks and you can barely see anything in it. And that uh, was one hard-learned lesson, which is that dew matters a lot. Water has a, has a very powerful um, uh, uh, thermal property it, uh, in terms of that it basically, if, if you get everything wet, uh, it will mask everything else that's under it. All you're gonna see is the dew. So uh, a good lesson to you if you are trying to do your own thermal imagery is pay attention to the dew point uh, as you have to monitor the temperature and the humidity on the day that you're doing your survey. And I would say get out there right before the dew point. That would probably be the ideal time in most scenarios. Uh, in this case, uh, waiting until after the dew point when the ground is all wet, uh, basically masked all of the features. Luckily, we have that early one. But this is basically the strategy that we do. We go to an archaeological site, and then we image it at various points throughout the night, because you often don't know which one's going to be the best. Um, OK, here's a, a second uh, case study. What time is it? OK. Um, uh, this, uh, this is a, the uh, uh, project I did teaming up with uh, Maddie McLeister and Mark Schur of the University of Notre Dame at a site called Middle Grant Creek, uh, dated to about 1600 AD. This uh, Native American site uh, outside of Joliet, Illinois, is on U.S. Forest Service land that is part of the Medewin uh, National Tallgrass Prairie. Uh, they've been excavating there for a few years, and they found a series of storage pits and activity areas, but so far, nothing, uh, the, no habitation areas, like so no houses, no structures of any kind, and they're not really sure where to look. So this seemed like a good site to try out thermal imagery on. The site itself was, um, Probably pretty large. Today it's uh, been impacted by the construction of a series of uh, TNT bunkers um, from World War II. So um, they're, uh, but luckily when they built these things, they were used to store large amounts of explosives, and so really no one went anywhere near them. So all of the landscape around the bunkers has largely been protected from development or anything else. Um, so uh, we thought that this area would be a good one to survey in part because of our analysis of 1939 aerial photography of the region in which um, a whole series of, sort of uh, dark circular spots about 10 meters across were visible in the earlier 1939 imagery. Um, those we thought might be house compounds. They conform to how um, Native American houses at sites often appear in this area. Um, so we decided to fly over that region. Uh, in some of the imagery, we, th this is a good example of some of the challenges that we face uh, in doing uh, this kind of thermal survey. Uh, it, the camera, even though it's supposed to be radiometric, actually has a self-calibration function. And so periodically throughout its flight, it will recalibrate. And it's supposed to. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, so that's what the striping on the, your left is from. Uh, Photoscan offers a color correction function, which will get rid of those uh, striping to produce 
a nicer image like the one in the center here although in this case the um, uh, uh, we get this uh, drift where there are darker values at the top of the survey and lighter values at the bottom that is because of the uh, the thermal camera has a sort of uncooled core that progressively cools during the time of the survey. So in this case, the flight of about uh, 30 minutes, the camera cooled and this results in um, this kind of drift over the course of the survey. This is more of an aesthetic problem, but it also would create problems for, uh, you know, so anyway, we've been experimenting with some methods to correct this, um, which uh, is possible, but I think that this can be avoided if we were to um, probably turn the camera on and let it acclimate to the temperature for something like an hour prior to flight. So that's what we're gonna be um, trying in the future. Anyway, we were able to find some of those house compounds like this one, but probably more excitingly is um, uh, this large earthwork that we discovered at the site. So this large round or hexagonal feature about 30 meters across has no visibility on the surface. Um, it shows it quite well in both the uh, 12.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. thermal images. Um, you can just about make it out in a, a digital surface model because um, this feature that is darker in the imagery is probably a, a pit or earth, a cut feature into the ground, so it's retaining water. That is also causing vegetation to grow on it a little more healthily, and in this case, that's why the top of it especially appears pretty clearly in the NDVI. And finally, on the bottom right is an experiment in which we've taken both thermal images and all four of the um, multispectral images from the sequoia and produced essentially a multispectral image across them and then simply conducted a principal components analysis on them to produce a new derived image. This is an example of the kind of thing you can do once you start collecting these sorts of data. Of course, this uh, requires the imagery to be very precisely co-registered to one another and so forth, and would hopefully not include some of the problems with drift that we've already encountered. But um, yeah, that's the kind of direction we're going. Okay, one last quick example. Um, we have been working a lot at this, um, I guess you can call it archaeological site. It dates to just to the 19th century, so maybe just in under the wire. But uh, the advantage for us is that it is uh, just about 20 minutes from where we live. So this is a site that enables us to kind of go out there and experiment with our new toys and our technologies. It's quickly probably becoming the best surveyed site in all of New England, I would suggest. Um, uh, th this is a, it's a Shaker village called Enfield. Uh, it has the advantage of having a whole series of um, photographs of the site at the time that it was occupied, um, and including a very detailed map showing where all these buildings are. This, uh, um, today, many of these buildings are gone, but their foundations are still underground. And so um, uh, we've used a variety of different methods to try to see how those buildings show up in various kinds of imagery. In this case, we're comparing an 11 p.m. thermal image, uh, an NDVI produced from the sequoia, and a visible light ortho image of that central part of the, of the village. And in it, several of the buildings show pretty clearly. I think in this case, it really highlights the potential of the multispectral imagery to reveal uh, subterranean features. Um, in this case, the foundations of several of the buildings show up quite clearly because they're impacting the growth of grass on top of them. And this is something that we could expect in a, any other kind of temperate region. It's something that, as Elise will probably talk about later, works less well in a super arid environment where there's no vegetation. But if you're working in a place with a lot of grass, you can expect that it'll probably work pretty well. Um, we've also done a little bit more experimental work in trying to uh, um, compare the way that those features appear in thermal or multispectral imagery with how they appear in conventional geophysics. In this case, looking at the location of several of those buildings um, compared to how they appear in magnetic radiometry. Uh, some of them show up, some of them don't. It's a little noisy as is common on recent historic sites. In this case, I think that the thermal imagery actually captures the locations of some of those buildings a little bit better, like this one here. Um, and this also is a place where we tried a few other kinds of experimental ideas with processing thermal imagery in different ways. In this case, using the uh, thing that I call a normalized thermal flux index. So uh, it is set out of the same basic formula that you would use to produce an NDVI, uh, except instead of using two different spectral bands, we're using two different thermal images acquired at two different times of the night, so an earlier and a later thermal image. 
uh, over which time the ground progressively cools. Uh, and so applying this formula, you end up with a series of values from negative 1 to 1 that illustrate the relative rate at which different parts of the ground have cooled. Um, and that can be used, in this case, zooming in on one of the buildings at Enfield uh, to highlight um, some of the features a little bit better. In this case, the uh, foundations of this large office building and uh, the entranceway at the top appear a little more clearly in the processed image than in a raw image. So uh, again, these are just some examples of, I think, what are a lot of uh, exciting possibilities with um, thermal imagery going forward. We're going to be doing this uh, at a variety of other sites over the coming year or two. If you have a site that you think would be great for this, let me know. We're happy to come out and try it out. Um, uh, anyway, so that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you.